Welcome to Manowaker Studios Flash Fiction Podcast. I'm C.B. Drogi. This week, Red by Emma Rhine. You'd made it 12 years, and it took one Tuesday piano lesson at 4 p.m. to break you. Ashamed, nonetheless, you stared like a common caveman when she wasn't looking and the gold band constricting you burned as it faded away. As Melly, your daughter, sick bastard, your eight-year-old daughter with her mother's eyes, learned middle C, you watched how the warm lamplight bounced off that red dress when Miss Lowell bent to place Millie's fingers along the ivory keys, and the backs of Miss Lowell's ivory thighs showed for a moment that kept you awake at night while Annie dreamed across the pillows. Miss Lowell's whole apartment filled with an intoxicating aroma that stopped your heart, and when she stepped closer for the check that you wished above all else didn't say Mr. and Mrs. Henry Wilkins, but did, and then she smiled, it was then that you knew you were a dead man. The funny thing is, you never stopped loving Annie. You fought like any couple fights, but then you made up like any couple makes up, and that system worked fine for twelve years. Melly, admittedly, brought discord. You and Annie had never considered yourselves an unambitious accountant and her husband who dropped out of college to paint houses responsible enough to have a child. Turns out they're easy enough. You just did for Melly whatever the neighbors, Mr. and Mrs. Fly Their Private Plane on Tuesdays, did for their son Reggie. And that's how you found Miss Lowell, the piano teacher, in her low-lit apartment that smelled like sin, in a dress that never seemed to settle itself on her body, but always looked for a way out of its obligation to cover her up. Annie could only take Melly to Friday lessons because of her work schedule. You got every Tuesday after school. It got so bad that you couldn't focus Tuesday mornings, and you spilled a can of eggshell all down into Mr. Tivin's Delilah's. Climbing the tight stairwell to Miss Lowell's apartment, with Melly's hand, sticky from the after-school chocolate that had become your Tuesday tradition after hearing Reggie got ice cream before his Wednesday lessons, your paint-spotted tennis shoes gained ten pounds. You must have, too, because with every step up the stairs you felt as if you sank lower into the depths of hellfire where you belonged. But when Miss Lowell opened the door and smiled at you, you shot right up out of hell and into a heaven where the angels wore red dresses and their golden hair loose so it draped down her front when she reached for the check. Two months of Tuesdays and you were convinced Annie knew because she didn't talk when she climbed into bed anymore. She just pulled the covers tight around her tired body and kept you up a half hour too long texting someone, blue light bouncing off the ceiling of your bedroom before it all went dark, and she snored, and you dreamed about how Miss Lowell's thighs might feel. In the morning, though, you clawed your way through the sheets, and cooked Melly's breakfast, and felt sick with yourself for even thinking of it. The ring on your finger grew heavy, and you stared at Annie's, where she left it on her sink so it wouldn't get lost, and wondered how you could do this to her. That Tuesday, you would break it off. There was nothing to break off, you remembered, the next Tuesday morning as you got distracted thinking about the red dress. It was all in your head. You'd never have the chance to rip off the ill-sitting red folds anyway, because Melly was always there. So why were you worried? The only person you were hurting stared back in the mirror every morning, and you could easily turn away. Miss Lowell's fingers gripping your upper arm flashed tingling ice fire through every vein in your body. Mr. Wilkins, could I talk with you for a moment while Melly does her scales? She asked in a quiet voice that set the wild shiver through you again. The dress was blue today, 
and it clung to her the way dew clings to rose bushes. Yeah, was all you could manage. She led you to the kitchen of her apartment, where the counters gave you grief because all you could see was lifting her onto one and tearing the blue dress off, while, sick bastard, stop it, Melly's dutiful scales floated through the air. Someone help you. You tried to remember how to breathe. Mr. Wilkins. Her hair smelled like spontaneous intrigue, desire. Y yes? I have something I have to tell you. Breathing was a forgotten art, and your heart hammered against your ribs like Melly practicing the stanzas marked forte. Y yes? She bit her lip. And that almost sent you back to animal instincts. Just skip caveman manners and go back to the rules of the jungle, where you'd be tangled in the vines and thrashing in the dirt, and the blue dress would be hanging from the canopy. Mr. Wilkins, I've been having an affair with your wife. Looking back, you can see the irony. You, the house painter, with your primal brain set all afire by the piano teacher who'd been playing in a different key this whole time. Annie. Poor Annie. Bastard Annie. Annie to whom you felt responsible. Annie who slept so well at night after texting her lover while your conscience tortured you to bed. Both of you yearning after that red dress and ignoring the strings attaching you to one another that must have severed years ago without anyone noticing. Melly told you yesterday, when she came back from college, she never even wanted to learn the piano. And the neighbor's kid, Reggie, is two years into a decade of doing time. This has been Red, written by Emma Rhine. Manowaker Studios Flash Fiction Podcast is supported by patrons on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash manowaker to find out more. The Flash Fiction Podcast theme song is by Kevin McLeod. Manowaker Studios Director of Dice is Ben Baston. The podcast is produced, edited, and narrated by me, C.B. Drogi. You can follow me on Twitter at C-B-D-R-O-E-G-E. -E. Thanks for listening. On the next installment of Flash Fiction Podcast, couldn't you get a communication system? said Patty. Those just translate neurotransmitter signals or hormones, something like that, I said. The messages were nothing more than, I love you, I love you, I love you, when he lay beside me, and panic, 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 when I was at work. <laughs>